Isaiah 53. Now, today I'm going to be going through a few passages, different places. And um, I'd been contemplating this, this uh, message for quite some time, and, and, and I, I think our church is ready for this message, um, simply because being silent and then sometimes... I mean, I've mentioned some of these things from the pulpit, but being silent in these areas where uh, people are at, at their worst in their life, there, there's things going on, and they're looking to God for help, and that help that they're looking for is not coming, is leaving people uh, confused, angry, and... And, and, I, and I'm watching this progression just just continue to go. And, and because it, it is a, a false teaching, we, we constantly have to, to uh, uh, rebirth this on a different level, making excuses on, on why it's not working out. And if, if you're not caught on yet, uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about healings. And um, yeah, I, I guess maybe the reason many years ago I, I looked into this is because of the, the field that I worked in. Um, i seen Christian people die from their diseases. i seen non-Christian people get better. And coming out of, out of a, a word of faith mentality, I always had to question what's going on with this. Why, why are Christians dying? And, and of course, I, I, I understood it, it, either they didn't have the faith or the people praying didn't have the faith. Something was wrong. But at the same time, the non-believers were getting better, and, and so none of it made sense. So I realized... I need to take a really good look at the passage because it, it doesn't matter how much education you, you may have, whether that's um, in the field of your career or whether that's a, uh, in seminary. It, it doesn't matter. One thing that only the Lord can begin to show us is, is our habits. And it, many times when we've been taught something our entire life, then we just start believing that without realizing we've never even taken the time to just look at it. And I'm going to do this today. I'm only going to mention the Greek one time on one passage. The rest of it is just going to be a common sense approach. Simply because, I guess, with everything that I've been going through here recently, I'm, I'm around many people that are sick, and, and, and they're, they're not understanding, and some are even upset, aggravated at me, uh, God, the church, you, you, you name it, because they're, they're, they're having unrealistic expectations and it's unfounded expectations, and they're looking for it. So in Isaiah 53, let's go ahead, and, and, and I'll just start in verse 1. We'll cover the first five verses. It says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant... And like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and reject, rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not." Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him as stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. 
He was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, or I think the King James and others say, and by his stripes we are healed. That's where we're starting at today. Now, what happens when someone like me comes and, and, and makes a statement, this is not speaking of a physical healing, or it might have some, may, may be some overtones of physical healings, but the, the, the context is a spiritual healing. So after the first service, I realized maybe I need to explain a spiritual healing. Why, why, what, what's going on that, that we should need a spiritual healing if we are saved? Well, it's simply like this. We're, we're going to find out because we're living these unregenerate bodies and we still carry a sin nature. So there's times that in our life, each one of us in our Christian life, that, that we either get tired of serving God we don't want to have anything to do with the ministries of God. We don't want anything to do with the church. We maybe we're just we're just really struggling with with some type of sin in our life. And what what the root of that is, if if you find yourself there many times, is there there's probably and I'm not talking about growth. I'm talking about you know that you shouldn't be doing it. But you struggle with not doing it. You kind of want to do it anyway. Well, there's, there's something that the spirit man is looking for. And I don't know who, who gave it the title, but they come up with what they call a spiritual healing. This is talking about a spiritual healing. Whether you want to go from the unregenerate person that's not even saved till they get saved or the Christian person that is saved that's really just struggling trying to live for God. So this is what, what I'm defining as a, a spiritual healing. You, you're just not living up to what you should be, what you should be doing. You, you're constantly just... Not not accidentally falling short. You're you're just just flat out in rebellion, and we need this. So what happens is when this when this happens, and I make a statement like that, then people get upset, and they 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 immediately go forward and say, "So you don't believe in healings." So let's make that clear. Absolutely, I believe in healings. I believe in divine healings, but it appears today that the Lord works more in, in modern medicine. Now, I believe all healings come from God, but it doesn't seem that it's divine as what we would think of a miraculous miracle. And, and plus, let's just, let's just lay it all out on the table. Because, I mean, I, I didn't write the Bible. I'm not the author of it. I'm a student of it. But when you start reading the Bible, you get into the New Testament, and when you see the church being formed and fashioned, you see the apostles at work, you will find in the beginning, you will find a lot of these apostles performing great miracles. I mean, we see Peter walking into the temple and the man that had been laying lame and there every day for his life, 30-some year old, I believe he was. Now, all of a sudden, Peter reaches down. Well, you can read back in Acts chapter 2, I believe it is. And, and, and you know, Peter says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And immediately they say his ankle bones stretched out. And he began to dancing and praising God for the miracle. Not only that, you see Peter walking through the streets and his shadow overcasting people and they would be healed. You, you see uh, uh, example after example, but as we begin to progress into the Word, now all of a sudden we don't see it as often. We, we hear Paul 
saying that I have an affliction and I've asked the Lord three times and the Lord answers my grace is sufficient. Or we see Timothy who is a pastor of a church that he has an ailment and some of these other people that, 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 uh, uh, that are helping Paul in his journeys. And Timothy here has an ailment and Paul, instead of praying for Timothy that the Lord would heal him, and no doubt he did pray for him, but the Bible doesn't bear that out. But he says, Timothy, take a little bit of wine for your stomach. So we, we have to look at all this stuff. And, and it makes Christians get really nervous for some reason when all you're doing is following a, a progression of the Bible. But before we even go there, let's deal with this healing thing. In Matthew chapter 8, you don't have to turn there, I'm just going to read uh, three verses. In Matthew chapter 8, and I'll begin at verse number 13. Uh, you, can, you can find it throughout the Gospels, many places. But in verse 13 it says, And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed who all that were sick. Now, when, when Jesus was doing this, obviously he hadn't been to the cross yet. But not only that, but he had not even been whipped yet. He had not, uh, of course, gone to the cross. He was going to bring salvation. That's where this last part of this in, in that passage says, This was to fulfill that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. And, and, I, and I can't, listen, I have just a limited amount of time here, so this falls a lot on you also to, to begin to dig into the Scriptures. But we see that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. And you can read on, he healed those that were paralyzed. He healed the ones demon-possessed. He cast demons out. He done all of this long before he ever went to the cross, long before he was even whipped and beat. The point I'm making is, but, but we want to take that passage in Isaiah, and I'm going to read its counter that, that complements the passage in 1 Peter here in a moment. And we want to apply that to that, that he is talking about because he took these stripes, by his stripes you are healed. No, Jesus was healing long before the stripes came. He was already healing. The healing's not in question. And for some reason, whenever we take that passage that's being taught out of context and we present it, people get really nervous. And some even be, people get upset that you're, you're saying that there's no such thing as healings. No, the healing was here. The healing is already settled. Christ, he, he created these bodies. He surely knows how to heal these bodies. Healing is not in question. What's happening here is there's going to be life back to the spirit man. We're, J Jesus, especially after he goes to the cross, so it's it's not about it's not about do we believe in a healing? Yes, we believe that God can heal and He can heal divinely, but it's about a passage that's being spoken out of context. And why does that matter? Because people are walking away from God because we're teaching them something that's not biblical. Maybe not in your life. Maybe you, you don't encounter it. But folks, I'm telling you, there are some people that are just outright angry and mad. They, they've, been, they've been sick. 
or they've, they've, had, they've had Christians to come into their home, their loved ones dying of cancer, they're, they're praying for them, and then they're declaring and decreeing their health, and in two or three days or two or three weeks, these people are dying, and it's leaving them angry. They're angry at God, they're angry at the pastor, and they're angry at the church. So we don't have an answer. So what we've got to keep, so we have to, we have to come up with an answer. So the answer is, you didn't have enough faith. Or the person praying didn't have enough faith, which leads that to the next level is, and, and, and I've had people to do this. I'm sick in body, but I don't want Irv praying for me. Now, it's okay if Carolyn prays for me, or it's okay if, if Steve prays for me, but not Irv, because Irv's faith wavers. Now, I'm not saying your faith wavers. I'm just saying this is what is said. Because, see, there always has to be an answer on why we didn't get healed. And then if if... When, when that doesn't work, now we, we take it even to the next level, which I, I listened to a, a little mini sermon on this topic. You lost your healing. And once that's not going to suffice, what are they going to come up with? Let's take it over to Peter. Remember, we're, we're, the, the question is not about does Jesus heal? Absolutely he does. All healing comes from Christ. I don't care if it's from, if, if, if it's from herbs you're growing in your garden or the medicine you're getting from the pharmacy or the doctor you're seeing. All healing comes from Christ. And, and I'm gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about that in a few moments, but let's go on to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. This, this is a, a counter, or not a counter, but a compliment to Isaiah, to Isaiah's writing. So I'm gonna back it up to verse number 7. Uh, uh, 2 Peter chapter 5, verse number 7. Now, this passage, to stay, keep it in context, it's going to talk about, it's going to start out, patience in suffering. Patience in suffering. Remember that. And then it's, going to, then it's going to move into a prayer of faith. Because Peter is telling us one thing, that we need to have patience in our suffering. And then he's going to show us how we can have this patience in our suffering. So let's back this up to verse number 7, chapter 5. In uh, in First Peter, let me get over to the right passage here. First Peter chapter, I'm sorry, First Peter chapter two. We'll be going to James chapter five. First Peter chapter two. So I almost messed up. I almost went to James. So that little tidbit that I gave you there just kind of x that out. So we'll go with James, or 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to run this down to verse number 23. So let's get this said and done, and then we'll get back over to James. Verse number 23. All right, let's go up to verse 18. Let me just get this under, un, un, uh, kind of in context. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also the unjust. You know, the same concept is here. He's telling us what to do, and then he's going to show us why we can. Verse 19. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and you suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, 
leaving you an example. Now remember what we're, the, the context we're reading here, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continue entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, stripes, you have been healed. See, Peter really helps us get the, the, the concept now. He's telling us, you're, you're getting whipped and you're being mistreated because you've done evil. Big deal. You deserve it. But you're being mistreated. You're, 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 you're being ridiculed when you've done nothing and, and you do not react in a negative way toward people. That's a gracious thing in the sight of God. Why? Because Christ has suffered for you and what he has done we mimic he we we will have to suffer also and then he tells us why we can endure by his stripes you are healed that we no longer live to sin but to righteousness in other words he's fixing this spirit man yeah, it ultimately was answered on the cross. This is why I, I, I do not believe we're talking about a salvation message here because the, 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 the whippings did not bring salvation. It did not bring the, the, the recipe for salvation. It was Jesus going to the cross and shed His blood, innocent blood, on that cross for you and I that opened the door up for salvation if we finished the work that He did. So we're, 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 we're not talking about, even if, if you believe the opposite, we're not, we're not even saying that, that you don't, you're not going to heaven. It's, it has nothing to do with if you're going to heaven or hell, but it has everything to do with properly interpreting the Word of God because it's causing too much of a problem today. We've left this unchecked for way too long, and we've got to address this problem. And a huge problem it is. I, I, I know it'll be because I know I'm going to get the emails or I'm going to get the messages or someone, there, there's going to be several people even in this church that are not going to like this. But it's not about what we like, guys. It's about what the Scripture says. Remember, again, Peter is telling us all these things are going to happen. He said, but entrusting himself to him who judges judgely. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin. We go all the way back to Romans. Romans, we see Paul. Paul is talking about we have to die to sin and live to God. And he, he keeps talking about the things I want to do, I can't do, and the things I shouldn't do, I find myself doing. We have to die to sin and be alive to God. Not that we live a sin-free life. But that's why we've got Christ. Because even when we, when we start struggling with doing the right thing, we have a... a, a a person by the name of Jesus Christ that we can come to and he can immediately fix this spiritual man. Guys, I'm going to tell you, if this passage is talking only about a physical healing, it would not deal with sin. A physical healing will never deal with the subject of sin. That's why it goes much deeper than that. And, and again, maybe, and I realize, you guys don't, you're, you're, we've got different crowds of people that we see. But, listen, I, I know pastors, and, I, and I'm quite convinced that 
that many times they're, they're, they're really talking to me. But they're taking this passage and they are doubling down that this is absolutely a physical healing. And there is no way. In, in, instead of... I, and, and I don't get... I just don't get it. I do not get it that we, we call this a spiritual thing going on. Why that... Why wow, that's such a, a terrible thing, because I just read to you one scripture, and I could read you many, many more of Christ and His healing. But I'm going to tell you something. We're going to go to James. I, I had never seen this before until this week. And I, I consider myself an, a, 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 a student of the Word of God. And I found something in James this week that, that, that truly uh, blessed me and encouraged me tremendously. In James chapter 5, there's where we're going to go. And we're going to back up to verse number 7 in James chapter 5. In this, we're going we're gonna to actually... Read and then compare what we're doing today, and it appears that we're right in line with, with James's passage here. Verse 7 Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth being patient about it until it receives the earthly, the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brother, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering in the name of the Lord, behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. Now he's talking about steadfastness. We need to know how we can do this. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Verse number 12. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Now here comes the prayer of faith. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, con confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power, and has working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three and a half years, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. James is over here, and he is asking the question. He's going to deal with this healing. Now, there's some things going on in the Greek here. Uh, I, I never studied the Bible without, without studying the language in which it was written. Because sometimes we lose, we can lose some things uh, in, in the English translation. James is talking, he says, Is there any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. 
letting them pray over him. It, the only part of the Greek I'm going to talk about is the grammar part. This would be the verb, for lack of a better term. And anointing or oiling him with oil is the participle. Now, if you're not familiar with what a participle, a participle is to a verb as an adjective is to a noun, just in case you didn't know. And the reason that's important, because the main, the, the, the main purpose and the main clause that's being spoken here is the first part, is, is what we would call the verb. Let them, if, if, let, let them pray over him. This is the main part right here. And I'll be honest with you. Uh, even the English standard, I'm, I don't know about the legacy, but most all the Bibles use the word anointing, anoint him with oil. Well, if you begin to look at that word anoint right there, it would be better understood for us today, it, unless it comes with an explanation, if we would answer it or read it this way, oiling him with oil instead of saying anoint him. Because in the Christian world today, when we use the word anoint, then we use, then, then what comes to our mind is something spiritual going on. In other words, if, if you pray and anoint someone for the work of the ministry, or anoint someone uh, for the work that they're going to do in another country, or, you, you, you know, even, even the anointing and the oil, sometimes we, we want to couple it with the Holy Spirit. And th th that's what the anointing can mean, but that's not what it means here. Now, there's two thoughts. One, the custom of the Jewish people, and if you've studied the book of Revelation, whenever it's talking about uh, working a day's, working a day for, you, you know, your wheat and your barley, and it ends up, but, but see, you don't hurt the oil and the wine. It can have some medicinal value, but it can be very expensive. So one of the things that the Jewish people would do, they would, if they were sick, they would rub their body down with oil. Now, if you were an emperor or a pharaoh or something like that, you would probably take a bath in oil. I, I can just see in my house, Dorothy having a whole bathtub full of this essential oils. I told Dorothy, I said, you better be glad we don't live in the medieval times or they'd be burning you on a stake out here saying you're some kind of witch with all these oils going on in this house. Uh, but, uh, but that's only one consideration. And that one we don't follow other than we've always been taught when we pray for somebody, we should anoint them with oil. Folks, if we're not careful, we, 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 we delve into mysticism. I'm not saying there's anything wrong. I, I, I still do it. But, but if, if we start treating that like it has some type of mystical powers because you anoint with oil, you're, you're missing, you're missing this, this what's being said here. Because looking at even the revelation, see not to hurt the oil and the wine, understand the, the expensiveness, but it has some medicinal values. This is what James is also saying right here, that this oil could be... Uh, uh, actually, let me just read it the way I wrote it down. He could have in mind a medical treatment of believers that's been battered and bruised by persecution. This is what you find. I, I mean, it's not something that I'm thinking of. This is what you can, you can find when you begin to, to look at what James is saying here in the Greek. It's got some medical value. Now, 
it's kind of like what we do today. When we get sick, we start taking, whether it's herbs and vitamins, or we go see our doctor. Because James is telling us the healing comes from God. Period. But these other things are also beneficial. And it appears today that God is working through modern medicine. That may change. That may change. It may change quickly, especially uh, with... And I'm assuming that they've went ahead and done it, turned over a, a lot of our, our, our health decisions over to the WHO, the World Health Organization, and, and they'll, they'll determine lockdowns and everything on anything going on. I, I believe our, our government's already signed this over to them. I may be wrong, but if they've not, they're going to. So we, we very well could see a time in our life where we will have to depend on God because we don't have the avenue for this other that we've become accustomed with. Regardless of how it works, the healing comes from God. Now, I'm going to share a story with you, an event in my life, that um, it required me to take a look because I realized that I believed what I believed about healing because it's what I was always taught, that I'd never actually took the Word of God and rightly divided it concerning healing. I worked for 20-some years as a paramedic in Fentress County, Overton County, or uh, Pickett County, some in Scott County, Cumberland County. And I've seen a lot of people die. When I started making the transitioning out, I started was part-time and I moved into the full-time ministry. There was a lady that I worked with, and because the ambulance service was right next to the hospital, I, I, I counted those hospital employees as people I worked with because I, I, I would help in ER, x-ray labs, you, on the floor, push medicine. I, I was helping at the hospital every night. And there was a lady that that worked there, that, that I'd known her my entire life and, and even became better friends with her uh, at the hospital. Well, when I left, about a couple years after I left, she all of a sudden came down with cancer. She, she was diagnosed with cancer. And the job that I had took me away from here. And um, so... The family kept trying to get me to come and see her, and every time I'd try to go see her, she would be gone. The hospital even got involved. This was how much that she was wanting to see me. And so this went on for about a month. Well, during that month, I, I realized something was going on for her reaching out to so many people to get in touch with me. So I began to pray. And, and just, you know, Lord, I want to be prepared for whatever this girl needs. I want to be able to help her. And uh, just as sure as I'm standing here, I felt so impressed that the Lord was going to use me to help her prepare for death. Now, that went against everything that I believed. And I struggled with that. But when I finally did go see her, that's what I did. I'm not going to tell you her name, but I told her, I said, listen, if the Lord doesn't heal you, you're going to die. And I knew this girl to be a Christian, and I'm, I was sure she still was. I mean, I, it only been a couple of years. But, but we talked all about salvation again. We talked about our walk with God. So I, I was very well... Uh, 
confident of her, of her eternity. And I was only with her about an hour at her house, and I left. Two days later, she died. Well, about two weeks later, they was having an event, a rodeo or something at the fair, and I was there, and, and some of the family seen me out there standing at the gate, and they come and talk to me, and they said, Roger, said, um, we just want to thank you for, for coming and talking to her, and, and she told us what you talked to her about. And said, we want, to, we want to thank you for that because she was scared to death that she wasn't going to heaven if she died because everything she'd been taught about if you have faith you'll be healed so she's afraid she's committing some kind of sin because she she was afraid she's going to die so she thought she had doubt and then and then she got angry at some people that tried to come in and tell her no if you have faith you're you, you know and 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 she was dying. I mean, she, this girl was dying. Well, it put her mind to ease, and about two days later, she went to bed, and she went to sleep, went on to be with God. Family was very appreciative, but the Christian community ridiculed me because I didn't have faith. How could I, a, a pastor, a man that doesn't that preaches God's Word, how could He prepare someone to die? Apparently, I didn't have faith to believe that God could heal. Folks, I'm here to tell you, I don't know if you know this or not, but if the Lord doesn't come and get us out of here, every one of us are going by the grave. These bodies are going to lay down at some time, and they're going to die. Then we'll receive our ultimate healing. But I'm, and and she, she did receive her ultimate healing, but that wasn't what she was being told. They were talking about, no, you're going to still live on this earth. I never said anything about that. I sure didn't ridicule the church over it. But folks, the time has come we're, we're just going to have to. We're going to have to stay with the word, and, and and if it offends people, it's just going to have to offend them. And I'd rather offend you now, and get you prepared, not only for what you may have to face yourself, but something that you may be able to help someone else with. Because, believe it or not, you're here for more than just yourself. And the body of Christ is hurting today. And we're hurting because we bought into lies. You, you know, I, I get ridiculed because I said we don't have the big A apostles anymore. We don't. We don't. And let me make this very clear. In that passage, the elders that it called, the elders... In no way, shape, or form are they looked at in that passage as bringing healing to that person needing prayer. Absolutely not. No way can you confer that to them. We've seen the apostles doing the miraculous, and today we do not have apostles. I don't have time to go into all that. I understand that, that Paul speaks about this fivefold ministry. That was at the beginning of the church. Well, once the foundation was set, there was never a need for the apostles anymore. Because, listen, guys, if you actually believe there, there still are these apostles like Paul, even though they, they carry these names, then what we've got to do... We, we've got to reopen the Scripture, and whenever they speak, we've got to add it. Because a true big A apostle, when they spoke, God said, it goes in the Word. It's as Jesus speaking it Himself. And that's, that, that, study's, that study's been ready forever. That study's coming. 
because we need it. Never in the history that I can think of the church do we need the truth of God's Word. And, and, and I'm not saying I've got it all right because I don't. I have messed up and, 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 and preached error more times than probably anybody in this world. And it's, but it's made me super cautious on statements. Christy, I know you've got, a, you've got a song. Just come on up. While she's coming, if you're one of these folks that really get bent out of shape when we, we, we take a passage like by a stripe you're healed and and, and, and we'll walk you through that passage showing you this is not a physical component, I, then accept that the Bible is speaking this. But then don't get upset because it doesn't take away healing. Healing's still here. We've not subtracted healing. I mean, anyone that says that God doesn't heal, they're, they're a fool. He's healing in your life and my life every day. Now, granted, I, I've had a rough year, and, and, and I don't know, the next year may even be rougher. And the Lord may not. Only thing I can say, if the Lord doesn't, if the Lord doesn't heal me pretty soon, then I'm going to have to buy new clothes again. Because whatever's going on in my body is... But you know what? That matters little. What matters is the Word of God and speaking the truth of God's Word. And folks, you need to take that and you need to share it because I, I, I would say there's people in your life that need to hear this, that need to hear that God loves them he may not heal them, but He loves them anyway without giving them some type of false hope. And then the best you can do is, is cross your fingers and, and just pray and hope they get healed. Because if they don't, then, then you're going to have a mess and you're going to have to deal with the family. And then you're going to have to give an excuse and you're going to have to blame somebody. No, so, it's in God's hands. But if you're struggling, if you're a man here today struggling with porn, you can get healed of that immediately. Right now. Immediately. If, if you're a woman that's struggling with whatever, I'm not a woman, so I don't know what you struggle with, you can get healed from that right now. Guaranteed. Immediately. Not tomorrow, not next week. He can bring that healing to this spiritual man so we no longer run after sin, but we live for righteousness. Right now. If you're sick in body, I can't make that promise to you. But I can promise you this, God will walk with you no matter what you're going through. That's... The Christian, the Bible is showing us. No matter. God will be with us, and our trust is going to stay in Him even to our dying breath. Go ahead, Christy.